Right. Ha. Yeah. All right. So, on the behalf of Department of Philosophy and the Cognitive Science Center for Center of Phenomenology and Cognitive Science, uh, we welcome uh, all our participants and special guest, Professor B.T. Sebastian, who has uh, retired only in the technical uh, sense of the term, but he's still very active academically and uh, he's uh, writing his books, new and newer books. So we welcome our Professor V.T. Sebastian, who has retired from our Department of Philosophy itself. And um, uh, this special lecture is taking place under uh, the uh, ICPR study circle, uh, that is Elenches. And uh, we are looking forward uh, uh, for Professor Sebastian to be speaking on phenomenology and uh, consciousness. That has been his, uh, uh, these topics have been very dear to him and we have been listening him. But it is an honor to have him here and share his views uh, with the new uh, generation altogether. Uh, students of students uh, certainly would make uh, some difference uh, to him as well and to it, ma it makes a lot of difference to us as students of uh, Professor Sebastian and it is an honor to welcome our uh, another teacher Professor Geeta Manakthala who has been uh, teaching us uh, uh, philosophy of language, philosophy of culture uh, and uh, I also now uh, request our uh, 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 Professor uh, Seema Vinayak, Chairperson, Department of Psychology, who is also uh, part of uh, the Center of Phenomenology and Cognitive Science, Department of Philosophy, to formally uh, introduce Professor Sebastian uh, to our students and participants. Uh, over to you, Professor Seema Ji. Thank you, Shivani ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, I own knowledge and cognitive sciences. Uh, would like to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished uh, speaker, Professor Sebastian. Welcome, sir. Though I have heard a lot about you, and I think uh, Shivani ji has given us the opportunity to meet you uh, once here again here and really introduce you. So I welcome all my colleagues, students, and all the party participants who have joined us today for this special lecture by Sir. Uh, Professor Sebastian, a well-renowned personality and does not need any introduction, but it is my privilege to briefly share the achievements of Sir. Now, it is a proud moment for us to welcome our senior colleague as Dr. Shivani has just shared that he has retired from the Department of Philosophy, uh, Punjab University. Now, he is ICPR a senior fellow. And uh, the briefly, I would like to introduce that he has been a visiting professor at JNU, uh, New Delhi, and then National Emeritus Professor of Philosophy, UGC. He had been a visiting research professor, Center for the Study of Culture and Values, Washington, D.C., visiting research professor, Center for the Study of Culture and Values, uh, School of Philosophy, the Catholic University of America, Washington, D.C., the list is too long and I think uh, I would be uh, taking the entire time of the uh, lecture allotted to the lecture if I start reading the achievements and uh, the details which and the work research works which sir has done. He has uh, more than 40 publications and has published uh, uh, 11 books. He had been the editor of a number of journals, to name a few, Journal of Human Values. Then uh, he has been a, a research a reviewer for and editor for a number of journals. He has been on the, uh, he has been a member on a number of editorial boards, advisory boards, and is a visiting professor and adjunct faculty in number of universities. So I welcome you again, sir, and uh, thank you, Shivani ji, for giving 
me this opportunity to briefly introduce our senior colleague welcome you sir well i welcome all the participants and i won't take more time now because we are eagerly waiting to hear what dr sebastian wants to uh, tell us and wants to share his experiences welcome you sir thank you I now request uh, Professor Sebastian, maybe, uh, ma'am, if with your permission, uh, no, no, sir, can maybe start his lecture? Yes, please, please. Yeah. Yeah. Well, welcome you, sir. I think we can start with the lecture, please. Yeah. The, thank you, Professor Chairperson, Department of Psychology, Dr. Shivani, Piyush, Dr. Professor Gita Manakthara, and uh, all the participants. Well, it is actually a rare honor for me, even by my students, like Shivani and Piyush, they would invite me for a lecture over here on what is phenomenology. When, when I was asked by Piyush to give a lecture, to give a talk on phenomenology, then, then I asked him a question, what's it all about me? I mean to say, uh, because he, he asked me to some, give a, you know, a basic uh, concepts of phenomenology, what is phenomenology, that's it. So now let me start the question, what is phenomenology? I think this question can be easily answered uh, by a, a story recounted by Simone de Bauer in her autobiography to tell us of how Jean Paul Sartre's interest in phenomenology was first aroused by their mutual acquaintance with the uh, Raymond Aron in 1932. Raymond Aron was actually spending almost uh, more than a year or so in um, French Institute in Berlin, studying seriously about uh, Husserl to write about a historical analysis of Husserl in phenomenology. Later from Berlin, he came to Paris to meet Sartre and uh, Sartre, you know, hosted a, a party for uh, Raymond Aron and in one of the uh, best restaurants over there. And the speciality of the restaurant was actually, but to say, apricot cocktails. That time, I don't said, pointing to the glass, where, which was, I mean, holding by Saad. He said, Saad, yes, my dear fellow, if you are a phenomenologist, you can talk about this cocktail and make philosophy out of it. The point is very simple. Philosophy, you should describe. Describe the objects just as we have seen them, touched them, or heard them. So, from this standpoint, let, let, let me start this. I need to say, if I said that phenomenology is the description of the objects as it is shown, there the first question or the first point which comes here is that what you know, description of what description of the phenomenon that is i mean which is shown to the consciousness or which is given to the consciousness therefore phenomenon means what that which is i mean anything that appears to or presents itself to someone that is to say that a phenomenon is that which shows itself in itself and from itself. Am I making am I making things clear to you? A phenomena is that which it makes or to say which shows itself in itself from itself. It means that you know there are things, I mean a phenomena can show itself as something something else also. Once it is shown as something else then that is not phenomenon, that is semblance. So I am, first of all, I'm trying to make a distinction between phenomenon and semblance. Phenomenon is that which shows itself to the consciousness as itself from itself, whereas the semblance of what say it is something different. It can show itself as something different. Okay, now, there are different kinds of phenomena. For instance, you know, perception. See, hearing, touching, and so on. That means 
when I am seeing something, there is something which is shown to me. When I am touching something, I touch something. Therefore, this is one kind of phenomenon, that is to say, perception. There are other kinds of phenomena are there. They are believing, judging, wishing, remembering, uh, evaluating, uh, or uh, remembering, and what not. Okay. So this is a different kind of phenomenon. And there is there is another kind of phenomenon again. That is to say, they are, I mean, I am reading something. Or what to say, I am pushing out something. So I am talking about three different kinds of phenomena now. One is the so-called phenomena, which is the perception, seeing, hearing, touching. Other one is believing, remembering, imagining, wishing, willing, anticipating, you know, like that. And third one is something which I am pushing, something which I am pulling, something which I am lifting, like that. Okay, now. Therefore, uh, you know, the thing which I wanted to say here is that, you know, that, I mean, you know, especially philosophers have a problem. I mean, the people who are, uh, you know, what to say, you know, how to put it, I mean, this way, when you talk about the phenomenon, okay, or phenomena is that which uh, appears, or we can say appearance, okay. Therefore, the philosophers usually some who make a claim that which is that I mean, appearance and reality. Says that no, that which appears uh, or appearance is not reality. The reality is something which is actually different from appearance. No, this is the first point which I would like to say. That actually, in, in the phenomenology rejects the apparent dichotomy between this appearance and reality. That which is appears, that is the reality. That is to say that. That which appears to consciousness, that is the reality. Therefore, um, another dichotomy which I would like to say, okay, that is the dichotomy between, uh, what to say, the inner world of private experiences and the outer world of uh, public objects. Maybe the best example I can say is about, uh, I mean, uh, the best example is uh, represented by, I mean, uh, what to say, the God, he is concept of body and the mind and the body is the ergosome but body is what? extended thing and the mind for him is what to say the thinking thing therefore this dichotomy which is talked about the God okay this is the another dichotomy that is to say a dichotomy between the inner world of private experiences and the outer world of uh, what to say the public objects so this dichotomy this is also rejected by Ramarologist okay now let me come to the the, the corporal thing. You know, description of experience. Of course, we started with the description of experience. Okay, description of experience or experiences. You know, show that there is experience is experience of something. Okay, I cannot merely talk about experience. I mean, I am always the, my experience is what my experience of something. I mean, you know, that is to say. There is a, always an object is there for experience. Now, for example, I cannot talk about a perceptual experience without, uh, without describing what it is. And therefore, for any kind of perceptual experience, you no, know, there is a perceptual object is there. Without a perceptual object, you know, we cannot talk about a perceptual experience. Okay. Therefore, that which is seen, that which is heard, that which is remembered, that which is imagined, that which is built. That which is uh, you know anticipated. Therefore, there is always a you know object is there, whether it is a, a perception or a concept. Okay. So the thing is that uh, in the feature of God, I mean this feature of a conscious experience, I mean it is called intentionality. I mean when I am perceiving something, when I am conscious about that something, okay, that is called the intentionality. And this person of intentionality. Of course, it has, a, it has a big historical background. Maybe we can say from St. Thomas and Pinas on both. Or maybe from France and Ghana we can talk about, you know. But, I mean, in fact, of course, it's a, epistemologically what was actually, uh, what to say, uh, talked to by you know, Husserl. So, intentionality means what? Consciousness is always the consciousness of something. Or, we can say, directionality is the capacity of consciousness. We cannot talk about a bare consciousness. That means every consciousness is always the consciousness of something. That means something is there. Okay, this of. 
and uh, of course when we go, when we come to the internationality concept you know, maybe there is some philosopher by name Maurice Butler about in the knowledge of perception he talks about uh, different kinds of two kinds of two kinds of internationality one is the internationality of act the other one is the uh, operating internationality okay so internationality of act is that supposing that uh, consciously willfully if i am wanting to become maybe if i want to become a university professor or you want to become a teacher of course you see it is a willful act if i want to you know uh, go to the mountain okay to climb a mountain it's a willful act i mean therefore consciously volitionally intentionally when i am trying to make something when i am trying to achieve something that is the intentionality of act whereas the operating intentionality is actually what it is very simple thing in fact i mean the sense that now Operating internationality, but I mean the consciousness operates in itself. I mean it finds a situation where it knows how to how to act. And if I am a driver, if I know how to drive, because you see, I mean if you know, I put it in the in the first gear, I know, and I don't look into the the, the speed of vehicle and see whether it is 20 kilometers like that. Now see, automatically it goes to first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear, like that. I mean to say, depending upon the speed, you now I mean it operates. The consciousness has a Inner capacity or inner capacity within which it operates, and this is the operative intentionality. So that's a different phase that we know. So now the thing is that I mean, we started with the the the, the, the Sabian glass. I mean the the, the cocktail glass. Okay. So I can say that the, this feature of conscious experience is it is called intentionality, and the cocktail that uh, a soft what is experienced, and uh, what to say, it is the I mean. Uh, 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 you know that that cocktail that 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 soft experience in the in the the hotel, it is the what to say intentional object. Okay, so therefore there is always a intentional what the, the the consciousness. I mean the, the, the simple logic is that consciousness intends always an object. We cannot talk about a bare consciousness. But of course, you see, of course, being a being a student of Indian philosophy for some time. I would say that, of course, maybe in Indian philosophy we have a bare consciousness. When the students, that especially, of course, if I, I mean, my students, they know that because I usually say that. You see, the Vajradhara the Upanishad, for instance, you know, when Yajimal uh, Kya, okay, Yajimal Kya was asked the question, what is that by knowing which everything is known? And of course, he said this, he said this, he said like that, no, and not this, not this, okay. And uh, you know, he comes to the point that the consciousness. Once it can come back to itself, and it becomes the certainty of itself. That is the maybe another I don't know what is the objectivity level. I mean, consciousness is not conscious about anything but itself. That's it. Okay. This is the different kind of level in a way that I don't want to come here. I mean, that is not the cup of I mean, the so-called Western uh, terminology. But now, uh, maybe the second point which I would like to state here is that now. Um, What to say? Yeah, phenomenological study. Okay, it's, 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 it begins with the examination of consciousness. Okay, I mean to say, the starting point of phenomenology is the examination of consciousness. Human consciousness has the capacity to assign meaning to objects of experience. Among all human capacities, I would say the most important potentiality of man, the human subject, is the capacity of Assigning meaning. If phenomenology is anything at all, okay, I mean, following that, if phenomenology is anything at all, I mean, it is nothing but a search for meaning. I mean, not the lexicographical meaning of the words or phrases, okay, or idioms, but it is a search for the meaning of the question. What does it mean to me? Okay, what does it mean to me? But arrive at the question. What does it mean to me? Phenomenology undertakes an arduous and tedious task of, what to say, uh, task. And during the this talk, I think I wish to talk I talk to you, talk to you something about that. Okay. Now, maybe the third point which I would like to come here is that Husserl holds that all our usual cognitive enterprises. Involve a large number of presuppositions, such as material presupposition, 
cognitive presupposition, connective presupposition, quality presupposition, formal presuppositions, religious presuppositions, of course, there are uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and the like. Okay. In the final analysis, then what happens is that now all these presuppositions tell us one thing that there is an external world existing independent of our consciousness. I mean to say that all these presuppositions, I mean to say material to formal to cognitive to cognitive to quality to all kinds of presuppositions now, they somehow point to one thing that now there is an external world which is existing independent of our consciousness. And this is the claim which was then rejects total and unambiguous. There is no external world independent of consciousness. Very simply, you know, it. Okay, I need to say all presuppositions, I mean to say whether it is material, a formal, cognitive, or religious, whatever it may be, and you know, the world which we claim that there are there's a world, there are objects which are independent of my consciousness, you know. That is the presupposition. And that is the presupposition. I mean, presupposition, what to say, which the person rejects unambiguously and totally. He firmly asserts that everything is dependent on consciousness. And he asserts in his uh, ideas, ideas, you know, ideas one, that everything is dependent on consciousness, not only for its meaning, but also for its being. This is the point. The consciousness is dependent, okay, not only for its meaning, but also for its being. Okay, this is the Maybe the, the, the third or fourth point I would like to say. Now, while confronted with the, when we are confronting with the, the presuppositions, Husserl's response is this: We do not pay attention to the existence of the world and objects therein. Rather, we suspend or bracket the existence of the world or objects, and we pay attention only to our consciousness of them. I'm coming to the second point. I mean, from the international point of view, I'm coming to a very, very basic structure of phenomenal uh, detection. I mean, you know, I'm so good detection. Okay. So he says that, you know, when I pay attention to the object, to the existence of the object, okay, I do suspend the existence of the object. Rather, I pay attention only to my consciousness of them. Okay. If I am paying only my attention to the consciousness of the object, then that means it is not the existence, existence of the object which matters to me, but the essence of it, the meaning of it, the sense of it. Okay. Therefore, this is the, I mean, the existential reduction. Okay. Or the phenomenological reduction. I do not concentrate my attention upon the existence of the object, rather, I pay attention to my consciousness of the object, okay, not the existence of the object as such, okay, but I do pay attention to the, uh, what to say, consciousness of, um, attention to my consciousness of the object, okay, and uh, this is, I mean, what I, I mean, I will put it in this way, what is pertinent here, or pertinent to me, is the meaning of the object, or the sense of the object, or the essence of the object, not the existence of the object. Okay, this is one of course, see, the starting point of the phenomenological reduction, or we can say the existential, existential reduction, or uh, the object is actually looked upon as just object, and without having any intentional relationship to the consciousness. Okay, so this is the natural attitude, okay. The natural attitude, you know, we do not claim that the object has something to do with its intentional intentionally it is with the object. Okay. We say that no, the object is actually situated or it is there independent of my independent of my, independent of my consciousness. Okay. For us to see this natural attitude is actually what to say, you know, I mean we, we overcome this natural attitude and then we come to a what to say, phenomenological attitude. The phenomenon that comes to my consciousness appears to my consciousness, okay? And that phenomena is meaningful to me because of the essence of it, the sense of it, not about the object as a term. I mean, I am least worried about the texture of it, the size of it, the color of it, but I am concerned about the meaning that gives to me the, the particular form. That's it, okay? Now, this suspension, I mean, we have been talking about this suspension, this is called the existential reduction, or on the, on the other hand, it is also. I mean, a reduction 
aimed at arriving at the essence or the sense or the meaning of it. Therefore, it is an artistic reduction. So, existential reduction is, uh, you know, by you know by reducing the object and it permits existentiality, you know, and coming to the meaning of the thing, the sense of it, you know. So, I make the essence of it the artistic reduction. So, existential reduction is also uh, an artistic reduction. Okay. Now, uh, well. After having completed the existential status of the object, am I making sense to people? Hello, hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can. We are listening. Okay. Are you yeah. you understanding what I am talking about? Acha, this has to be told by students. Beg your pardon. Haji, Ankush, Garima, okay. Oshi, are you able to make sense? Do you wish to ask anything? Yeah. Uh, I I couldn't understand a lot of it because there was some kind of a background noise going हाँ, on. हाँ वो वो मुझे भी आ रही है सर. There is some noise, technical कुछ disturbance आ रही है. There is no one here. In fact, the room is closed in a way so that cannot be. Uh, maybe the maybe the computer or maybe the laptop which I am using is an older one. Maybe maybe because of that I believe. The for the audio, ma'am, I think he can join from his mobile cell phone. I think it's a hardware problem with the mic in laptop. हाँ माइक और लैपटॉप सर साथ में ना हो आपका हाँ अब नहीं आ रही अभी भी है पीयूष काइंडली सजेस्ट क्या व्हाट इज टू बी डन For uh, uh, Dr. Pius Ji, if he can join for the audio from his mobile, then it would be fine. Just for the audio. Okay. Omir, itna complicated mat karo. Ne, wo badi mushkil se is cheez ke saath adjust kiye hain. Acha, thik. Ha, wo aur complicate karenge ham to wo heal. Ha, ha, ha. Please, uh, Ankush, if you have got some questions and queries, saath saath puchte jaaye. So that it becomes more interactive, and he also has yeah, yeah. something. I, mean, I would like to. I would like to maybe maybe that you know, but to have the interactive session. I am wondering maybe. Yeah. On my mobile. Okay. Sir, so then you have to leave from uh, your uh, laptop. Computer, sir, if you are. Sir, on my. My mobile is uh, better than my my laptop. Better than your, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. That's wonderful. Yeah. So Mr. what I was talking about? I mean, what I was talking. Shall I recapitulate what I have been talking about? Just yes, sir. Please, please do it for uh, two two minutes. Well, I was somehow talking about what to say, starting with maybe a story recounted by um, you know Simon de Beauvoir, when I was saying that you know, I mean, how. Jean Paul Sartre got aroused in the study of phenomenology because, you see, Aaron, Raymond Aron, when he visited him in Paris in 1932, he told him that no, that see, uh, you can, uh, you know, what to say? If you are a phenomenologist, sir, you can talk about the this cocktail as the what to say? Um, the, you can talk about this cocktail as the um, you know. Uh, cocktail and make philosophy out of it. I, I mean, you know, make philosophy out of it. Understand that? No, the point is very simple. That ph ph phenomenology is nothing but a kind of a description of the object. Okay, as it is sh shown, as it appears. And then I said that no, the phenomenon is simply anything appears or um, uh, presents itself. 
as, as something to, to one's own consciousness, it means that the phenomenon is that which shows in itself, as itself, from itself. Therefore, I was trying to make a decision between what is phenomenon, which is which shows itself as itself, from itself to one's consciousness, and and which can show itself as something different, and that is semblance. Therefore, I was trying to make a difference between that which is phenomenon in one side and that which is uh, uh, what to say, you know, semblance. Okay. Then I was trying to. T I was talking that now in phenomenology, we did not make a difference between appearance and reality. Because that which okay, because first of all, phenomenology but rejects this dichotomy between appearance and reality. Okay, and then I was, again I was talking about uh, another dichotomy between what to say, uh, you know, between that which is the private experience and the pri and the public object. Okay, so may I interrupt a bit? Hello, uh, may I interrupt a bit? Sir okay. Akush wants to ask you something. Yeah, please. please. Ah, so, uh, you just said that uh, phenomenology does not uh, take into account uh, that reality and uh, what was that thing? Uh, My, you know, you, we cannot what to say make a you know difference in that level. You know, the the question is very simple. That when I talk about the appearance and reality, okay, here what happens is that you no know, anything or uh, any distinction between the real and the apparent is one of uh, is one that operates. Within the general category of phenomena, all of which is actually phenomenology is concerned about. Okay, therefore, the reality which you are talking about, that all comes later only. But that which is shown to me, shown to my consciousness, is that I mean, it's, it is a phenomenon. A phenomenon means what? That which appears to my consciousness as itself from itself. That's it. Are you getting uh, sir, can I just intervene and ask? Is it like a metaphor that we use? The object shows itself from itself. Uh -huh. At the, I mean, from itself, it it shows like as if we are accepting that uh, the outer world is absolutely real. It is pragmatically real, or it is from paramarthics that it is real. We are not differentiating. I'm not so bothering about that because I've told that which is. Plus itself, you know, it means that there is something against my consciousness. See, that you see, in object, and there is another term is there, ob hyphen jet. Something is projected against something else. That is what an object is actually shown itself as itself in itself. Okay. There, it. there is there is no scope for nomina as such. There is nothing left out. What you are seeing. What the, I mean, the, the, I mean the the conscious problem about the nomenon. And the phenomenon. Ah, okay. no. ah, ah. No. Therefore, in the, in the Husserlian phenomenology, appearance and reality, we are talking about, especially logical positivism, you know, they, they talk about that. I mean, they, they reject that. See, mm. maybe in scientism, of course, I, I, I can give you, I mean, uh, Galileo or even Descartes, no, they talk about the physical world as, as the real. Whereas in phenomenology, we don't even bother about that because you see, that which is real is what? That which is really something which is pre-theoretical in character, pre-thematic in character, pre-logical. That is the life world. Life world means what? I mean, I usually mm -hmm. give an example about two things. One is the Jagat, other one mm -hmm. is the, uh, what to say, Sansar. Mm -hmm. What? An objective world. What is Sansar? Sansar can. That which keeps changing, that which Sansarati? My own subjective world. Oh. That's my sansar. Okay. The Jagat means what? You, Shivani, and myself, and Angush, and all of us are actually participating in that world. That's, a, that's an objective world for me. Okay. That's a Jagat, objective world, which can be objectified in front of me. But apart from that, Jagat, 
there is a competitive world is on sar mm. and which what is happening well, i know i know about that it is pre theoretical it is pre thematical it is pre logical it is pre scientific therefore from there only the meaning appearance in fact you no know, i provide meaning we want to say only there so i uh, you know read my point therefore you know, from the life world okay hmm am i making sense to you hello it does but i'm still little confused that once we say that the object shows itself it comes up on its own it is more like uh, it is just like another phenomena of consciousness they are equivalent so we really cannot distinguish between the subjective world and the objective world they are just one because no. it is no. as no. my consciousness existing i will i will also existing see suppose in that you are saying something i am also saying the same thing okay now but the response of yours may be different from mine are you getting my point therefore ne that that different support your subjective world your apprehension your insight your ambiguity your perplexity your experience you know therefore i have my own you know my own world a world which is invented reinvented experienced and reinterpreted by me and therefore i am saying that no the sensor the jagat is different from the sensor this is a purely subjective world and subjective world is conditioned and controlled by what controlled by my experience and my to say background this is it this is now when i say about the phenomenon phenomenon is actually what phenomenon is that which appears itself as it is from itself hmm are you getting it that's it that's what i I, I, I get the spirit of it but yet to have the concrete meaning of it but i do understand that the no, object no no you are actually yes. you are taking the the whole thing from the paramarthika or by the you know entire level is it i mean mm, you know, mm, mm, mm. no but i understand that there is no there are no. two three points very clear in your lecture that one is that now there is no uh, demarcation between the subjective and the objective world the objective world exists in itself and <clears throat> it exhibits its existence thank you that my point is that actually husserl talks about husserl actually reduces all kinds of presuppositions he says that no all our cognitive enterprise is actually conditioned and controlled by different kinds of presuppositions maybe it is cognitive it is cognitive um, right what to say what to say it is a uh, formal it is material it is cultural it is it is a religious therefore uh. says, huh? therefore we claim that i mean some go we think that no our what presuppose i mean presuppositions are actually conditioned by these kinds of presuppositions okay na but he says that no and we claim that there is an external world independent of my, independent of my consciousness which of course is that he says that there is no external world independent of consciousness your consciousness means that no you that is a world right so once we are dead the world is dead that's it that means of course is the the world the objects may be there the objects may be there does not mean that of course it has some meaning fully therefore that's what i told you i started maybe i will third point we talked about that no human capacity i mean the human consciousness has a capacity to assign meaning okay and mm. mean to me that's the point here okay therefore the world all the there are objects are there i mean there's a computer is here there's a table is here there are chairs are here books are here everything is there but it, i mean i cannot claim that it may be there i i don't i don't say it is not there it is there but it it, it, it becomes meaningful to me only when i am conscious about my consciousness of the objects okay now and this what this act the acts of acts of consciousness which is the perception so the experience that is what is the intentional get talked about intentional is again is the consciousness of something of direction consciousness is always the consciousness of some direction you cannot talk about the bare consciousness consciousness is i may that is to say it is of something and therefore there is a no i am i mean you know what to say there is an object is there and the object again if i if i put it maybe strictly from logical sense you know this is that's what told you about the existence sorry that the first of all i suspend my existence of the object and i am by suspending the existence of the object okay i i am gradually and increasingly becoming aware of my consciousness of of the object therefore without the object by 
consciousness of the object. Therefore, the object as such, of course, is the, I am just bothering about what is the, I mean, the object here. Therefore, this is what is known as the existential reduction, or we can say the identity reduction. Idea, the essence, the essence, or the meaning. So, can I say something? Please. please. Uh -huh. You know what I have gathered from it is that the external world is there, the objects are there, but we are only conscious about those objects through our consciousness, and that too, that we get the essence of those objects. That is the essence, and then we try to interpret or give meaning to what we are experiencing in our own consciousness. That's it. Yes. Am I right? Yeah. That, that, this is what I'm talking about the existence of I mean, the existence of the object is there. At the same time, that is not meaningful to me now. It is not relevant to me now. Okay. Yeah. Therefore, uh, I have uh, my consciousness of the object. No, that is what is meaningful to me now. Are you yeah. yeah. And the consciousness would become aware only if there are objects. That is also presupposition. Because what would the consciousness be aware of? Later on, it, we are conscious about being conscious of the objects which are being there and we try to give interpretations and the meanings to those objects through their essence itself. That, that, that's what I said that, no? I mean, the, you know, the highest capacity of human consciousness is what? The highest capacity of human consciousness is to assign meaning. We, yeah. Assign meaning, of course, is saying the way you are assigning meaning to something and my meaning. I mean, what does it mean to me? That's the point. Okay, you know, something which is, uh, you know, something which means to you. That's an objective, objective world is there. At the same time, the subjective way, I mean, the way which I want to say, confront the object and give meaning to the object. No, that is different from you and me. That's it. Am I but making sense? How we communicate with each other if our we, we give different interpretations and meaning to the same object which is existing outside. Then how can you communicate? This is a pen. Okay. You also agree that this is a pen. Okay. But the thickness of the pen, okay, when I say if it is a white pen, okay, the whiteness is in what? I am partaking in the there's a if you're white, maybe some kind of a concept of white is there for me. Okay now. So therefore, it is now the whiteness means I mean, you know, it can resemble sorry, I mean what to say, it can evoke certain other kinds of responses within me. This one working up. Therefore, I am saying that no. I mean, you know, you, know, you are concerned about the logical. I mean, well, the logical positive is that like, no, the objects are there. Now I am not. I am saying no. We go beyond that. That's it. In technology, we don't. Therefore, we, have, we don't make a you know, difference between the appearance of the object, or maybe like uh, you know, okay, you know, uh, you know, appearance and reality. You no, know? we don't make that because that with appears to consciousness. But it's self peace what that's it. That's all. Hmm. There is a question uh, by Bhupesh Chandravanshi, sir. I think uh, he wishes to ask that are we considering first the presupposition that he seems to have developed is that are we considering this subjective and objective world as one? Are they one in phenomenology? No. They're different? No. So, can you please tell me once more? I'm going to get to place. No. Are the subjective and objective worlds they are one and different? One or different? No, the world is actually one. There is an objective world is there. But huh. the way of my perception of the object, the world, you know, that yeah. is different. That is different from your perception of the object. That's okay. what I thought. Every kind of perception, you talk about what to say, perception means what? One is, of course, seeing something. Okay, now, the perception. Mm. Which, mm. Every perception needs, there has to be perceptual object. See, mm -hmm. I'm thinking, okay, now, this is right. one part of it. But there's another yeah. part of it, you know, another kind of perception we can say. One is that, my, you know, my, my remembering something, my imagining something, my believing mm -hmm. something, my understanding mm -hmm. something, my evaluating something, judging something, okay, now, there, mm -hmm. there's something there, the object is there, okay, now. Well, mm -hmm. the, the point is that, no, there is a world, an objective world is there. At the same time, the objective world is visualized and experienced by you and me doesn't mean that, of course, we are seeing the same thing. There is a difference of opinion. Maybe, I mean, if you are seeing something, you may like to see the texture of it. I may like to see, uh -huh. the, I may like to see the beauty of it. And even uh -huh. You know, like that. So my judgment 
my appreciate my understanding my acknowledgement thing will be different from a to b and b to c uh, huh. there is a but, but sir, that that would mean that it is a, it is a, uh, it is the problem of perception but not of the object it is the interpersonal perception which matters but not it does not belong to the object as such correct therefore what i am saying is that no phenomenology as i told you it is nothing but the study of consciousness because phenomenology is what i mean what is phenomenology phenomenology is actually it is a heterogeneous philosophical movement okay number one number two i mean it is concerned about the meaning of something or about about consciousness okay and mm -hmm. it is is a connection between what is that which is empirical and the non empirical empirical is what something which i have seen perceived mm -hmm. evaluated okay now and how do i give meaning therefore it's a study of uh, what to say the essential structure of consciousness and it is the uh, you know it's a study of essences or the meaning that is the consciousness of it gives the meaning i i do this and that's it Am I making sense? No. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah, I understand I, that. I, I, I don't have a blackboard here or a whiteboard here. Of course, I could have shown something the way which we perceive something. Okay, just as Mana could talk about that. See, I mean, huh. I mean, I make some kind of thing here. People can say it is it, it, the birds are. I mean, you know, these are birds. So, you know, yeah. Different like that. Therefore, it is all depends upon the way which we perceive the thing. Of course, there is a. The thing is, some something which I have, you know, with the help of a chalk, you know, I must have put something over there. But the way the response from you and from others may be different from, I mean, differing from each other. That's what we need. Right, but sir, then how does the objectivity of the world would matter? It the world is no more than objective. That is why we are perceiving things differently. The world is then shouldn't be objective as such. And me are perceiving the go this thing as a as a pet, no doubt about it. Huh. At the same time, the way you, your perception or huh. the way thinking about the object is differing from me and you. That's huh. okay. There, there's an objective world is there. See, that does not mean that of course we cannot have subjective subjective elements. So there's hmm. a subjective element, okay, which presupposes my objective presupposition. That's it. Okay. So, it's not like uh, in uh, this particular study. What we are trying to know is how we per how we perceive things, like how we perceive objects. Is it is it we are trying? Is it what we are trying to study in phenomenology? No, not only how, not how we perceive things. Okay, how do we apply meaning to the perceptual object? That's it. So, how we give uh, like how everybody gives different meaning to everything. This is what we are trying to know. No, not even that. You just say human consciousness. I tell you, but there is a capacity to have any meaning. So I am saying that no phenomenology. In fact, actually, it begins with an establishment of human consciousness. Okay, and human consciousness has the capacity to have any meaning. Okay, to the objects of experience, objects of the, the things which, which one feels. Therefore, I mean, the way which I have any meaning to something. Okay. Although it's a pen, at the same time there are different kinds of what to say. I mean, you know, you know, thought patterns come to the uh, structure element of my, you know, my perception. That uh, is a uh, phenomenology anyway related to pen psychism. Pen psychism, like they talk about this, like uh, the same thing. No, pen psychism is actually what it's something to do with. Uh, I mean, you know, with the external world or something. You know, like. <laughs> Text that there is no dichotomy between this thinking thing and the mind because you see you cannot talk about a consciousness without what to say the human body. Of course, if you want, want to come to the if you read seriously about phenomenal perception by Morris Mandel, we can talk. I mean, the you know the embodiment. Okay, maybe the, maybe the visual thing. You know, the embodiment. You know, that which embodies the human consciousness. That is the you know body. You cannot talk about a consciousness without a body. 
where is the body that body okay we didn't make a possibility but to say there's a consciousness therefore it is that maybe if i use another point is term the intentional arc i mean human consciousness is not but an intentional arc okay so i was talk, in fact i was trying to talk to you about it, maybe the three kinds of direction what is so called the existential direction okay i mean i am just wondering about the object as such okay of course it is relevant to me but not meaningful to me that's it therefore i am concerned about my consciousness of the object that is the existential direction and second that is actually what and if i tell you i can give an example see imagine that i have um, no i was walking for uh, maybe maybe if i was um, walking for some um, 10, 10 kilometers okay match i was so much tired okay i want to relax i got a uh, you know i got a place where to sit it's a chair but i think that chair the chair is actually meant for me is what is a place to relax okay therefore what, what is the meaning which i am giving i am not bothering about the texture of it the size of it the color of it the beauty of it i mean i enjoy what oh, I can sit. Okay, now. Therefore, I just suspend the existence of the object. And when what happens? I come to the meaning of the object. But what is the meaning? Yes, it's a place that I can sit. Are you getting my point? Yeah. Yes. This yes. is this is what we call the so-called existence. I mean, existence in relation means it does not mean our. I mean, it does not mean that the object is not that it is there. Object is there, but no, I suspend my belief of the object for some time. in order to get a different meaning about it therefore you know it is a kind of what to say you know i, I mean i can reassign meaning okay that the chair is actually a place i mean you know it's a space where i can relax i can touch it hmm so are we studying like how we uh, how we give meaning to uh, give meaning to things in phenomenology how one like how i give meaning to something and how you give meaning to something are we studying the the that the thing in between that like how we give meaning starting for different kind of talking about i mean about the phenomena which appears to my consciousness actually about but i when when, when that thing appears to me as a chair a good chair i must the size of it okay na so when that thing i am not bothering about the color of it isn't it but you now i am so tired so my god this is a place where i can sit and relax okay now, therefore no therefore i mean I mean, the thing becomes meaningful to me in what way? Because you see, I'm so tired. You know, that's it. And then, then there is another kind of reduction. I mean, that is the so-called the psychological reduction. I'm coming to there are two, three kinds of reduction. One is the existential reduction. The second one is the psychological reduction. Psychology means what? See, suppose I mean you are seeing something. I am seeing something. And of course, you may have an idea that this thing was actually what to say to be a god. Okay, you can say. And somebody will say no. It is, it is because of scientific. Uh, a scientific, a science person will say something about being back there. Okay, or uh, you, know, you know, or we can say from evolution. You can say, isn't it? The human, suppose a human being, suppose in the Bible, of course, you know, I mean, in the Lord who created, I mean, the first day, second day, third day, fourth, fifth day, and the sixth day, and of course, he created a human being. Okay, now, but of course, the person who is a scientific person, he will never agree with that anyway. Because evolution, sorry, evolution. That's it, isn't it? Therefore, psychological analysis work. When you think about the mode of a being, you know, we'll always be filled with different kinds of doubts. Whether it is born out of creation, number one, born out of evolution, number two, born out of Big Bang theory, number three, and there are different kinds of things. Therefore, no. So therefore, this is the second, second. I mean, I'm not. Let, let, let me not bothering about. Let, let, let me not bother about what to say. It's. Uh, It is in chill, but I am the more of three. So this is the second thing. And uh, if I am able to do these two, two reductions, I mean, existential and the psychological, then the, the object which comes to my consciousness, okay, that is the what to say, without any presuppositions, without any this thing, that is known as the you know pure datum. That is the noema. Or what the primary call it term noema. Noema means you know, not every object is not noema. Object. Which is actually devoid of all kinds of presuppositions and all kinds of, you know, that's noem. And this noem, okay, is given a meaning by the I, the transcendent time, okay. And that that way, it is known as the transcendental reduction. Therefore, we can talk about three kinds of reduction. One is the existential reduction. Number two is the psychological reduction. Number three is the transcendental reduction. Uh, the transcendental reduction means what? The the 
I um, what to say? You know, the, you know. Yes. Um, yes. I mean to say. I mean the object, the better the, the object. I mean the object which has been reduced to a, you know, the noema. Okay, and uh, the pure. It is a pure in the sense that it is it is ready to receive meaning. I mean, a different kind of meaning assigned to it, and meaning assigned to it by the uh, transcendental ego. Okay, or, or I, I, I will put it this way: assigning of meaning by the transcendental ego to the Yama is called the transcendental product. Okay, so I see maybe. I can take maybe a post, maybe my Indian philosophy, maybe what to say uh, in the Swedish uh, Upanishad. Okay, now Swedish Upanishad. There are beautiful names there. You know, two birds plant from the same tree. Of these two, one uses fruit, and the other looks on without eating. Okay, I I will repeat that once more. Two birds plant from the same tree. Of these two, one Eat a sweet fruit, the other looks on without eating. And the bird, it is eating and you know, enjoying that is the so called embodied self. We can say that empirical ego, but there is a transcendental self or the functional subjectivity. That, of course, is it. That is what, of course, that is the basis of it. And we talked about this ego, that is the ego which provides. Or, as a, or, or assigns meaning to the 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 so my this after the existential election and the no the election. Are we sabar? No, I'm talking about maybe two three things. One is about maybe one is about the election, existential, psychological, and transcendental. Uh, Number two is about the so called intentionality. Okay. Number three about the Notion of uh, the life world. Okay, so it is more than the scientific world. I mean, Galileo's world or the or the Cartesian world. Okay, na. I mean, if that world, life world, from only meaning, meaning actually originates. The generation of meaning is only from life world. The world, what I can say, okay, it is pre-theoretical character, it is pre-scientific in character, and it is pre-logical, and uh, it is pre-thematic also, without a T. um i think so uh, i would rather say that um, yes that since it is just a very initial stage for um, all the students those who have uh, got admission into pg diploma course uh, with regard to philosophy as such so um, i would suggest that we have more of your lectures on phenomenology so that they get very uh, used to, to the terms And uh, expressions that we generally use in phenomenology, because it's not easy for them to catch up the spirit of uh, the words that you are frequently using: pre-thematic, pre-scientific, pre-logical. Uh, they may be very familiar. So, in fact, I would request you to uh, have more lectures with us so that we get to know. Without the theme, see, for any kind of scientific. There is something there. It is magic, okay. Whereas, you see, the thematic comes only from pre-thematic. Logic comes from pre-logical, okay. I mean, therefore, it is it is pre-scientific. I mean to say, scientific right. means, of course, it may be sort of. I mean, not philosophy. I am not a sort of. I am not a sort of philosophy. But the people who are in science, suppose they know that, no, there is always hypothesis, okay, na. So I mean, yeah. every every kind of what to say, science, no, they are always proving something, isn't it? There is hypothesis there, no. Therefore, they know about it. Whereas, you see. I mean, philosophy says that, especially Husserl says that. No, the scientific world. There is a pre-scientific world, which is which is actually the beginning point of all scientific theorems. That's it. Okay. Now, see. Uh, I mean, when you think about Husserl, as I told you, Husserl talks about the assigning of meaning. Okay. But the same thing actually talked about Heidegger, maybe in different way. Heidegger says that no, if I mean, the Husserlian sense, it is the Assigning of meaning in Heideggerian sense, it is the what is the interpretation? Assigning inter I mean interpretation. That is why Heidegger's terminology is known. I mean, you know, it is known as the hermeneutical. I tell you, see, 
I got different kinds of books. I am, a, of course, I'm a teacher. I mean, when I go to the kitchen to make a cup of tea, I'm not a university professor over there, isn't it? No. I mean, I, I'm something different. When I'm talking to my children, I am not a university professor. I am, I mean, you know, I am a papa for them, you know. Therefore, you know, we got different kinds of roles. And these roles actually, I mean to say, I interpret and reinterpret myself in different situations and different, what to say, you know, and different ways. Therefore, the Heideggerian sense, of course, is the, maybe that, of course, I mean, I think Heidegger is a little, little more because he uses certain other types, you know, in Vagara Vagara, Shayad, if I get a chance again, we can talk about the Heideggerian sense. Then, of course, once it comes, comes to another point, for instance, you know, it is something different. Okay. And, uh, you know, embodiment. He talks about embodiment, nationality, in a, maybe in a different way. And uh, again, if I come to Max Schiller, that's also something different. Okay. Therefore, I am saying that in phenomenology, maybe the forefathers of phenomenology, like Husserl, I mean, Heidegger, Marla Pondi, Max Schiller, you know, like that. But now, there are the I mean, recent phenomenologists, I should say, maybe like Piyush, you know, better, you know, you know better than me about that in a way. There are people who talk maybe in a, the, I mean, you know, different kinds of ways about, about the sort of phenomenology. Okay. And now, somebody was telling me recently that you know, there are as many phenomenologists are there as there are, what to say, phenomenology students. Okay. So, therefore, we can, I mean, you know, there are different ways. The way which I look at the thing, this is it. And it is only a method, I should say. The phenomenology actually, it is not a philosophy like a, you know, a virtualism or rationalism. It is a method of analysis. Okay. So it's a, you know, it's a method of analysis and, um, you know, a philosophical method. Mm -hmm. Probably we can say that it's a method to understand the relationship between the objective world and the subjective self. Maybe yeah. that can be said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any, any questions? Any and you see people oh. talk well and good. That is the starting mm -hmm. point knowledge again. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I so, uh, maybe next time we can do one thing that you just uh, talk about the nature of a world and the nature of self in phenomenology so that it helps us to uh, get into the skin of this uh, issue of phenomenology that how it perceives the external world and how it perceives the self or I mean, there is any interconnectivity between them. Okay. Uh, yeah, that would be very helpful to the, because they all come from different backgrounds. Many of them are from psychology. Many of them are from say, The nature of the external world is only one way I can say that, of course, you see, there is, I mean, there is no world independent of your consciousness. That's so it's more like subjective idealism, isn't it? No, no, it is not even subjective problem. People think that it's subjective idealism. No. See, ah. they say that, uh, I mean, there is no, I mean, it is actually, it is the word of presupposition. But one, one, I mean, one more thing is that, no, phenomenology is a philosophy which is, which goes, I mean, uh, you know, beyond presupposition, number one. It goes beyond metaphysics, number two. Number two. Number three, it is not even subjective idealism. Of course, when you say that, of course, there's an external world, there's no external world, independent of consciousness, does not mean that, of course, you see, I mean, it is subjective idealism. No. The subjective idealism is actually what? What do you think of subjective idealism? That it is there, the world is out there, so far I am there in the world. No. No, that's only partially correct. I mean to say, I mean, I. I somehow want to say that no, this is the world of my, I mean, this is the only world. Okay, something mm. world. I but create this world. No, yeah, not, out of images. Not that. Hmm. Not that. Okay, huh, Ankush, you have something to ask? Yeah. So uh, may may I try to you know uh, paraphrase this whole thing you're uh, saying? So that you can correct me while I'm going. So uh, what I understand from this is basically uh, I see the world through my perception and that is my understanding of the world and while doing so i assign certain meanings certain subjective meanings and sometimes uh, try to draw away my subjective feelings from a specific object and try to uh, make a objective decision of what the thing is and yeah come on Come on. Proceed. I think I'm right issues. 
लग रहा है कुछ गड़बड़ है Maybe there are some technical errors. Ha 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 ha. I mean, Sofa, he was saying, saying it right. Uh, where, where did I uh, lose my connection? <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I I don't remember. I don't know from where I lost track. You were talking about assigning meaning to the world. yeah so so uh, we assign meaning to uh, things in the world sometimes they mostly they are subjective but then sometimes we try to take away our meaning from the meaning that the other people uh, in the world assign to it and kind of try to make it more objective is is that what uh, this is all about <laughs> said too much of uh, technical issues i think uh, you know, so i i probably got my point across actually these are not questions rather the understandings and apprehensions that students are portraying they are observing what and they want to make it sure that what they are observing and understanding or comprehending is right i think so it won't be easy for them to write so long uh maybe so shivani once the covid is over if i am able to meet the students maybe directly that would be great sir that would be really really good I mean, I am a digital. I mean, in fact, I am a virtual self here. No, I am a digital self. You know, I mean, I am being a digital self. You know, I mean, rather, uh, you know, I mean, I cannot be what I am. Otherwise, in the classroom, in the classroom. That's also, true. That's true. Yes, yes, yes. I really feel myself very awkward here, but because you yeah. see, I understand. I can uh, really understand. It. But no, sir. One day, one day, the lecture or you will give. This nature of consciousness, nature of world. How, yes. You know, they are both connected. I mean, okay, the world and the well, the world and the self. We are talking about. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And acha, uh, there's another question from uh, Yamini. How do we tell apart the subjective reality from the object? Is it even possible? How do we tell apart the subjective? Uh, yeah. Can you elaborate your question yourself, please? This is not clear. Yamini, I think probably Yamini, are you there? Uh, yes, ma'am. So everyone sort of assigns meaning differently. So how do we really know what is real? No, I mean I am not saying that. Uh, I think that uh, some people misunderstood me. No, you see the way which I assign meaning to something. Okay, that is very subjective level. Uh, mind there is okay. There is an objective world is there. I agree with you. At the same time, the way I assign meaning to that particular object, no, is different from you are assigning meaning. That's what I meant. That's all. You don't uh, want to say, uh, you know, don't take it to that long. I am saying that no, the way I apprehend something, I I consider something. I give meaning to something is different from your way of doing. But my... sir, but sir, a glass is a glass for you too and for me too. A mobile, so, a mobile for you and for me too. How are, how are we assigning different meanings to it? The, see, I there was I can give an example now. See, maybe in my life, I have seen a movie. I have seen some 20-25 years old things. You know, um, words must be crazy. And a South African movie. I don't know. Have you heard about? Have you seen that movie? Yeah, Ghost. You know, it's yeah, it's one of the beautiful movies. In fact, I had seen in my life. You know, you know, you know. But to say, um, some people say, you know, you know, some aeroplane uh, was flying on the way. You know, they were drinking maybe some, you know, Coca Cola. Okay, they put that. That bottle somewhere in a place, and it went to a place where, of course, there some Adivasis were staying. They have never seen the so-called Coca-Cola bottle in their life, and you know they were living a comfortable life there. But you know, while seeing this object, you no, know, they somebody took it and you know went to the went to the chieftain's house, and somebody thought that you no, know, it can be made as a we want to say 
you know, a flower pot. Somebody thought of making it to be something different like that. Then they quarreled each other like that. I mean to say, this is, I mean, a Coca-Cola bottle has generated different kinds of meanings to the people and right. it has given to different situations. That's it. Okay, now. So I am saying that, no, I mean, like, a, like a, you know, the, the grass, of course, is the same thing. But of course, the grass, okay, if I am seeing, okay, the, the person is object, no? I mean, if I, if I go to the naivety of the class, I mean to say, without all presupposition, you know, there is a no I mean, okay. But what I am seeing, what you are seeing is that, no, we already presuppose that, no, grass is meant for what? Drinking water, for mm. more water, a cup of tea. No, mm. it will be different meaning also. Am I, am I correct? Hmm. We can have very many different ways, whereas, you know, we, because of our cultural presupposition, okay, we somehow think that, you no, know, a glass is meant for drink water. But it doesn't hmm. mean only for that. It can have different meanings. That's it. Hmm. Right. So that, that uh, we have another question from Pratyush that he says that, uh, does it mean that nothing inherently has a meaning? Yes. That means so. Because the I only, I only assign meaning to the thing. That's it. Does it mean nothing inherently has one meaning or does it mean nothing? Sorry, I mean, does it mean that nothing inherently has any meaning or not, not just one meaning? It must be having, it must be having a meaning, but it, it must have a different meaning. That's what I believe. In the sense that, no, it has a meaning. No doubt about it. But so, so I'm not, it is not in, not in connection with my consciousness. Okay. Okay. I mean, that obviously there, but that, you know, I mean, if somebody, I mean, see, the one is the object, okay, other one is the content, other one is the meaning. So now, the content is different from the meaning of it, and the meaning is different from the object of it. Are you getting my point? See, you can't, I mean, differentiate among these, these three, the object, the content, mm -hmm. the meaning. And the meaning of what you say, it is assigned by me, and the content is there already. And all these also. Okay. This is what. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's another question, sir, from uh, I skipped it somehow. Omvir is asking that is phenomenology is a philosophy of experience. That experience could be of anything ranging from self to the world. That's it. It's an huh? experience. Yes, it oh. is. It is. Okay. Yes. All right. So we have another question from Ankush. Objective meaning is assigned by the masses or it is assigned by individuals or individuals in masses. Objective meaning is assigned by the masses. Masses? All right. Yes, no doubt. Yeah. And Mama, and I have a question. Uh, Gur Sahiba? Uh, yeah, yes, please go ahead. Mama, I mean, I'm terribly confused at this point, but I'm wondering that if this is, if if we take an example of a baby or of an infant um, and we for a second assume that none of the genetic uh, inheritance that the baby has, maybe the temperament or whatever um, the child will inherit, if we like forget that. So from that perspective, will a baby be like a, like the, uh, a fine example of what phenomenology um, is trying to encapsulate? Like the way baby perceives the world, like an infant will perceive the world, because if the child has no meaning or has like no idea about things, um, say a mobile phone, say a glass. So is that what phenomenology is trying to... Um, yes, In fact, that is the starting point of phenomenology, I'm saying. That is to say, without any presupposition, it is actually a presupposition of this, I mean, uh, some philosophy. I mean, whereas suppose this, this world which, where you and... Uh, uh, what's the name? Yeah, yes. Madam, yeah. Living, we have all kinds of presuppositions, the cultural presuppositions, religious presuppositions, political presuppositions, scientific presuppositions, you know, what not. Therefore, no, let us start from the, from the starting point. I mean to say, without any presupposition, start the object. I mean, but you look at the object without any presupposition, okay, then try to see the object as an object, then as a meaning to object. This is it. Therefore, no, therefore we can redefine the object and, uh, and, and, and uh, thus we can give a, you know, a meaning to object. Okay, sir. 
and sir if uh, someone has to maybe do research in the field of phenomenology or i mean i'm not very uh, i'm not acquainted with the terminology that is used in this particular domain so uh, that would require immense training because it would be extremely hard to let go of the things that we have learned and then look at an object that we've been looking at say for all our existence so how does one conduct research and like uh, what, what is our training that one needs to undertake the best learning is actually i would say i don't know maybe i may be wrong i i should say you got to unlearn first of all many many things that's why phenomenology started i mean to say see i tell you you see when you look at a person imagine see shivani shivani was my student okay see i have some what to say you know some positive it means of course positive and negative okay now so in order to see about her in a different way look at it different way i have to what to say i mean eliminate All these presuppositions, you know. I mean, that 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 produces. So, for example. Presupposition less. That is the aim of phenomenology. Uh, that we all have our own presuppositions. Uh, presupposition lessness. That's it. Yes. Yes. that is the aim of phenomenology so thank you so much sir wonderful session i think it has generated a lot of questions and lot of uh, thinking uh, for the budding uh, thinkers and cognitive scientists i would say and i really hope and look forward to have you again on this platform and so if that I, if I not for con convince you people and if i able to confuse you people i am sure that <laughs> that will generate different kinds of meanings in this session yes 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 and it it certainly has done so as an abhi bhi i mean providing an opportunity over here and uh, the usual yeah. also also the the professor of psychology the chairperson i give you my yes 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 i i now formally thank you sir and uh, i also thank the participants and students and Professor Geeta Manakthela for taking out time. Professor Seema Vinayak, Chairperson, Psychology Department. I thank one and all for being here. Thank you, Professor Sebastian, and looking forward to have you again sometime very soon. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So my is better than my my you know my laptop. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully in the department, but these.